Can you hear me? Is this working? Good morning, Al Memorial Baptist Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in uh, this morning for a sermon, and we're going to be going through 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm actually going to be wrapping up this, the last part of this chapter today. I'm so excited to get to that. Uh, if you are a part of our church and <clears throat> you receive our weekly emails, I sent an email out saying that this. I think this sermon and this passage specifically is probably going to be uh, one of the most important passages that I speak on in the entire summer. Uh, I only actually have a few more weeks with you this week, uh, obviously, and then next week Johnny is going to be preaching, and then the following week, which is the last Sunday of July, will be uh, my last Sunday preaching here at Al Memorial Baptist Church. And so uh, that week I'm going to be jumping back and going through verses 1 through 7. Uh, but today we're going to tackle verses 17 through the end of the chapter. And uh, once again, I believe it's just one of the most important passages uh, that we have. Before I get too far into this, uh, I just want to uh, just make an announcement that on Saturday, uh, July 25th, we're going to be baptizing uh, Melinda Alton. She is uh, someone that is a part of our ministry here at Al Memorial Baptist Church, and uh, we've had the privilege uh, to be a part of her faith journey. She came to know the Lord here a little bit over a year ago, and right now, and she's ready to be baptized, and so I want to encourage us as a church to support her in doing this. So uh, we're going to be doing it down at the Hickories right there at the boat launch at 11 o'clock on Saturday, uh, July 25th, and so uh, we're going to have you know light refreshments available, uh, but we want to encourage you to just be a part of just a celebration that Jesus saves and uh, just that public proclamation uh, of that faith that transpired within uh, Melinda's life. And so uh, if you're part of our church, I really want to encourage you to be part of that. Amen. Well, uh, we're continuing, like I said, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start uh, at verse 17 and actually go through the end of the chapter. And um, I just want to remind everyone that Peter's big idea is that this is how believers should be responding to suffering. So Peter is uh, writing uh, not, not primarily to his, his readers of that day, but he's also talking about the church uh the church as a whole and and through generations and uh he's he's talking about this idea of a believer or the church's response to suffering suffering that may be self-inflicted or suffering that is unjust suffering uh and he's going to actually zero in on the former here at the end of this chapter but verse eight uh he says this is that the believer should respond to suffering with the right attitudes and we went over that verses 9 through 12 the believer responds with a blessing rather than evil uh, verses 13 and 14 the believer does not respond with fear there's no fear uh, with God. Also, verse 15, the believer sets Christ as Lord. And again, in verse 15, the believer must be ready to defend their faith because God uses these times evangelistically. Uh, and this is going to be the main idea coming forward now. Verse 16, uh, the believer must have a clear conscience. And this morning, this is the end of the chapter, the last paragraph here of chapter 3, is that the believer is being strengthened or prepared to suffering. And, and you did hear me right. The believer is being strengthened or prepared to suffer. This is what it says in verses 17 through 22. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedience, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark and in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through the water and corresponding to that baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him first Peter chapter 3 verses 17 through 22. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, just for this time that we can have together as a church to uh, be underneath your word. Father, we thank you for First Peter. We thank you for uh, Peter, the author. You spoke through your spirit, uh, through this man, not only to uh, that first century church, but also to us here centuries later uh, as believers, God. And I really, truly believe after studying this passage, this is one of the most important things that the American church needs to hear right now because of what's going on and so father help us to just have ears to hear hearts to understand and lord let us be 
bold and let us trust you and walk out in faith different because we are in the presence of your holy word and we have the confidence of your promises father we just commit this time to you make us students right now and we pray this in jesus name and everyone said amen well buckle up gang i got a lot to go through i hope you uh, have your bibles open and you're ready to take take uh notes uh but and and so i have i I hope that you can't catch what we said, what was being said right here. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh. And um, I really think that to catch what's going on in this paragraph and what it's all about is, is that we need to see how it relates to what was said before and what is going to be said after in chapter 4. So if you would, just turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. And Peter calls Christians to suffer if that is God's will for them. Okay, so you'll see the last verse of that, of that paragraph right before it says this. It's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Okay, did you see that? It's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for what is doing wrong. Okay, and, and, so, and so what is he saying? Sometimes it's God's will that we should suffer for what is right. Sometimes it's God's will that we should suffer for what is right. So how many of you would agree, right, that this is not an easy thing for us to hear? Okay, and I uh, completely agree with that. And I think you're going to agree with me with, with that as well, right? This isn't an easy thing to hear. That it's God's will that we should suffer for doing what is right. Okay, how many of you would continue to agree and say, Lord, because of this, we need your help. We need you. We need understanding and we need encouragement and hope. And, and God, uh, if, if you're going to will that we suffer for doing what is right, we need you. How many of you would say that right away? I would. So in verse 18, Peter begins this paragraph by saying, For Christ also died or suffered for sins once and for all. And that word for, so that starts here in verse 18, the word for shows us that Peter is beginning to explain why it is that sometimes God is God's will for us to suffer for doing what is right. It, it's that connective word for. For connects what he is going to say to what he just said. So the paragraph begins as this explanation or reason for the call to suffer as a Christian for doing what is right. Okay, and that's what uh, verses 18 through 22 are going to do. They're going to they're going to be the the explanation for unjust suffering. Now I want you to do something else. Okay, so so let's look at the connection between this paragraph that we're going to look at verses 18 through 22 and what follows in verse one of chapter four. So this next unit, right? This next paragraph in chapter four begins this way. It says, therefore, since Christ had suffered in the flesh arm yourselves with the same purpose so what purpose what purpose is he referring to it's the purpose to suffer for what for doing what is right unjust suffering just like what christ did so just before the text verse seven, verse uh, chapter 3 verse 17 and just after the text in verse 1 of chapter 4 this is the point he's saying get ready to suffer for doing what is right if it should be God's will. That's what he's saying. He's saying arm yourselves with that purpose. Or another way to say it is you need to get ready. You need to get ready, right? So church, what are we going to do? We're going to get ready. Okay? Peter is preparing us to suffer. Verses 18 through 22. So the main point of these verses is to help us get ready to suffer with Jesus for doing what is right and not doing what is wrong. Okay, and there's a distinction there, right? Now, for all those, um, for all the, the, the you know, the, this this paragraph specifically. So, as I read chapter three, I, I uh, like many of you, I'm able to completely follow along. But in this paragraph, there are there are some puzzling things in this in this in these verses, and I had to reread them many times, just like you would have, right? So, but. I, I just want to drive this home. 
we must not forget this main point. And I want to bring it up here, and we're going to bring it up at the very end. Peter's intention in this text is to help arm ourselves with the faith to suffer for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom. He's telling us to get ready, right? He's telling us to get ready. And here's the reason why. It's the, it's, it's the norm through, throughout most of history, right? And, and I know what I just said may sound irrelevant to you, right? That it's Peter's intention to help arm ourselves to suffer for the faith. And, but, and then the reason why we might just kind of not think about that or cast that aside is because like most Americans, right, we're insulated or we're padded from the bigger world outside, right? We are insulated in our little country, which, you know, ends up being about five percent total of the globe okay our little uh, even our little american era where where we've existed since 1776 is about five percent of the last six thousand years okay so for most of the world okay and for most of history being a christian has not been safe but as americans we've been insulated from that We've been insulated from that. Stephen Neal says uh, in his History of Christian Missions, this book, page 43, that in the first three centuries, when the church was spreading like wildfire, every Christian knew that sooner or later he or she might have to testify to his faith at the cost of his or her, her own life. Right? Well, what does that mean? That means this, that, that because they knew jesus and they were bold in their faith they were probably going to lose their life because of it and that is the norm outside of america not only uh for centuries right but it's also the norm uh around most of the world even right now and i want you to think about that imagine doing evangelism in a context where you could where you cannot make any promises to people that things would go better for them on earth but if they believe what you're offering them they would actually be risking their lives imagine if that was the norm and that was certainly normal in the context of this letter that peter and peter has applied that many times right and in most places around the world most of the time including today okay christians suffer because they identify with jesus christ in america right we have made this false assumption that safety is normal and i want you to think about that statement in the u.s safety is normal okay and all the u.s citizens said amen thank you jesus thank you military thank you forefathers right around the world that is not the case during the time of this writing, it certainly was not. For these believers, for others right now, being a Christian is like that. And I really think in America, any, for anywhere from five to ten years from now, that's probably not going to be the t case even here. Right? So the norm throughout most of the world. Today, it's normal in most places to suffer for being a Christian. To be safe and, and respect it is the exception and not the rule. I, I just want to give you just one example. Uh, evangelical missionaries entered Cambodia in the 1920s. And by the time that they were expelled in, 19, in 1965, there was about 600 believers. But between 1965 and 1975, during, uh, during the Civil War, the Christian population soared to an estimated 90,000 believers in Cambodia. And these Cambodian uh, converts, they evangelized, and they discipled, and they led more Cambodians to the Lord. And it was an amazing work of God. But something came. When the, when, when, when the Khmer Rouge, okay, which is, which is the, the, the Communist Party, took over, and Pol Pot, who was a Marxist, unleashed his fury on the nation, okay, most of these Christians died or fled the country. Don't believe me? Google Cambodia genocide or the Khmer Rouge genocide, and, and you'll see the facts of what happened there uh, during uh, the late 70s and 80s during this Communist Party regime. Genocide. And what's crazy about this story is that this story can be retold hundreds of times 
over and over around the world and along the centuries, okay? And because this is a true statement, it is normal, not abnormal, for Christians to be hated. That's a true statement. It's, it is normal, not abnormal, for Christians to be hated. Jesus said the most, the most sweeping thing in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9. He says, you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. It's a true statement. Not only then, but also today. And I really believe this. I think the time is right for a heavy dose of, of, of teaching of 1 Peter. In, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says this, Do not be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter in this book is laboring in this letter to say that as Christian, it is not surprising and not abnormal when the cultural powers revile Christianity. Matthew chapter 10, 25. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more the members of his house? So in this text today and in, in this whole letter, Peter is laboring to help us be ready to to suffer if God should will it. And that's why verses 18 through 22 were written. Okay, so we're going to just walk right on through uh, that paragraph together. So, and, and in it, we're going to find five ways that Peter prepares us for suffering. Five ways that Peter prepares us for suffering. Uh, say that 10 times, fam. Five ways Peter prepares us for suffering. All right, so number one, remember that Christ suffered. So the first thing that Peter points out is that Christ suffered, and we remember that. He, first, he insists that that we not forget that Christ, our great King and Savior himself, suffered. Verses 17 and 18. It is better if God should will it so that you should suffer for doing what is right rather than for what is doing wrong. For Christ also suffered. So throughout the New Testament, right, the, the mindset of Christianity is this. Our Lord suffered and we will follow him in suffering. Our Lord suffered, and, and the reality is, is that we're going to follow him in suffering as well. Paul says it. Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3. Oh, that I might know him and the fellowship of his sufferings and to be conformed to his death. Hebrews says this, that he suffered outside the gate. Hence, let us go with him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Uh, Hebrews 13 verses 12 and 13. Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and what? Take up his cross and follow me. Mark chapter 8, 34. I bear the cross and you will bear the cross. So the first great encouragement that we see here in this passage is that, is that we are to prepare ourselves for suffering, for doing what is right, because that's what happened to Jesus, right? The greatest, the most loving, caring, truthful, holy man that ever lived. If he suffered, you should expect suffering as well. Here's the second thing. Christ has triumphed and he's brought us safe to God. Christ has triumphed and he's brought us safe to God. Peter strengthens us to suffer by telling us that Christ has triumphed over our greatest enemy and has brought us safe to God. Amen and amen. Someone might ask, well, why would anyone become a Christian if what you could offer them was the things in this world would probably go worse for them and that their lives would be at risk. Why, why should anyone come to Christianity right on that promise? And the answer is this, is that the human greatest needs right, is not to live long on earth and to be comfortable, the American dream. The biggest human needs are, is how to have our sins forgiven and to overcome our separation from God and to live forever with the happiness of being in His presence forever instead of living forever in misery and hell i said it the word hell right the greatest human need is to live uh, for eternity with christ than to live for eternity in hell separated from him that's that's 10 times more important than living long on earth and being comfortable for a zillionth percentage of your existence eternity 
So this is what the death of Jesus accomplishes, right? Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Oh, that's such a powerful verse. I love this book. Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Yeah, I, I'm gonna do I'm just gonna take a little break here and kind of jump through. There's four things just in verse eight, 18 here. Uh, for, here's the first thing. Christ died for sins. You see that for sins? Christ died for sins. That this is what separates me from God is my sin. This is my biggest need. There, you know, these are my biggest enemies, not Satan, right? Right? Isaiah 59 says this: Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. Right? This is vastly more terrifying than suffering for righteousness, suffering for the wrath of God because my sins have not been forgiven. But Jesus died for sins. This is the greatest need in the world. I do not have to die in my sins. There is forgiveness. And this is why people would believe on Jesus even if it cost them their lives. Uh, keep going in verse 18. The second thing we see here in verse 18, Christ died the just for the unjust, right? So his death was substitutionary, right? He took my place. He stood under the wrath and the penalty that I deserved, and he bore it for me. His death was utterly innocent. That's why uh, in the news I just heard uh, a news commentator uh, say that, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, might have... Uh, made mistakes. That's that's absolutely not true. He didn't make any mistakes. His death was utterly innocent. It was substitutionary. The reason why he died is because he died for my sins. It was for all other sins and not his own. That's an important thing for us to know. Here's the third thing. Christ died once for all. He died once for all. That is, his death was final and all-sufficient to accomplish the forgiveness of all who believe on him. It has to be that way. He does not have to uh, ever offer another sacrifice. I don't have to add more on top of what Christ already did. Uh, Jesus said this, it is finished. It was all that was necessary to take away the guilt of my sins because the debt is paid in a full. Here's the last thing that we see just in verse 18. All of, the, all of these things brings me to God. All of this brings me to God. Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might do what? Bring us to God. That's the big idea, right? This is the great comfort of martyrs and suffering Christians. Our worst enemy, sin, has been defeated and Jesus has made sure that we will be at home safe with God. He has brought us to God. Separation has been removed. God is near us and he's for us. Our lives are hidden in him. So you might be asking, well that, well well how does this help us to suffer? Because one of the one of the terrible temptations of the devil in suffering is to make us think that God has forsaken us. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever gone through a difficult time and you just felt like God wasn't there? And that's a temptation from the devil in the midst of suffering, okay? So what Peter is saying here is this. He says, suffering is no sign that God has forsaken us and turned against us. Christ has carried our sin, he has absorbed the wrath of God, and he has brought us safe to God. And so when the believer suffers unjustly, suffering is not a sign that God is missing. Does that make sense? When, when the believer suffers unjustly, suffering is not a sign that God is missing. And I pray, I, I know, I know there's somewhere here this morning in our church, in our community, right, in our fellowship that needs to hear that this morning. That when the believer suffers unjustly, suffering is not a sign that God is missing. And that is a promise that we need to believe in, okay? All right, so that's 
that's the little caveat, right? So now we're going to jump back into the bigger outline, okay? Uh, as we go on through uh, this chapter, he says, remember the days of Noah, okay? And this is kind of where things get a little sticky, and I really want to just make sure I tread here uh, correctly, okay? So the third way that Peter strengthened us for suffering is with the situation that we see in Noah's day. So after referring to Jesus being alive in the Spirit, in verse 18, verses 19 and 20 says, says this, in which he, Jesus, went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who was once disobedient, with the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, I've read this many times, and many times I've kind of scratched my head and said, okay, what is being talked about here, okay? And so I'm not going to lie about it, but, and as I jumped into this and I started to really look into this, evidently there's a lot of controversy over what this passage uh, is referring to, okay? So I'm going to tell you what I think, okay? The way that I'm leaning and the people that I'm aligning myself with, okay? Okay. Um, and, and, and how it's going to relate to the main point, okay? I think that it refers to the time when, when people in Noah's day, okay, the, the time when people in Noah's day were disobedient, they were mocking him as a righteous man obeying God, okay? Which, by the way, does that sound familiar? Okay, that's, that's the same thing that was happening to Peter's readers as well, okay? So they were mocking Noah as being a righteous man and that Jesus in the Spirit was sent by God in those days to preach to those people through Noah, okay? And so just like in 1 Peter 1.11, okay, and if you turn back and, 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 and read that, right, the spirit of Jesus was in the Old Testament prophets predicting his coming. So in the same way, the spirit of Jesus was in Noah preaching to the disobedient people of Noah's day, okay, and are now in prison, okay, that is uh, in a place of torment awaiting the final judgment that we read in Luke chapter 16. So what's the controversy, okay? Um, he, 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 here, here's what some people think. And, and I don't take this verse to refer to Jesus going to the place of dead or afterlife and preaching to spirits there, okay, where they're at right now, waiting a judgment, right? And, and many wise and good uh, scholars take it that way. But I don't, I don't take it that way, and here's the reason why, is this. If Peter's point is that Jesus went to preach to all the dead, why would he say that they were once disobedient on the days of Noah? Okay, There were or are thousands of millions of spirit in the afterlife who have not lived in the days of Noah. Okay, So I think he's talking to a large group of people. Okay, or no, I believe he's not talking to this very large group of people who over centuries... Uh, but rather he's speaking to a specific group of people, which are the, the people in the days of Noah. So I take it mean that Jesus went to preach in the days of Noah through Noah to people who, because they rejected that preaching, are now in prison waiting final judgment. Okay, does that make sense? I hope it. I hope it does. And uh, if it doesn't, maybe stop and you know re-listen to what I'm saying, or uh, you know uh, read back through the passage but and i don't want us to get bogged down here right um and, and the reality is this is that we got to wrestle through these passages right i mean i very well could have just skipped that no one would have thought twice but i think we need for me i needed to kind of understand that and i believe and understand how it fits in this bigger con context all right um so from that i just let, let me just talk about three things that that noah uh, strengthens us for suffering. So just what can we glean from this, this little passage of Scripture right here? One, it assures us of the greatness of Christ. It assures us of the greatness of Christ, okay? And this is so important that we grab this. Christ is not bound by space and time, amen? He was there preaching thousands of years before, and he's here speaking today, too. He's going to be with you, as he said, in the end, at the end of the age, right? So whether you go to China or Congo or Bangkok or Afghanistan or Japan or Papua New Guinea or Siberia or the Philippines or the Ivory Coast or Australia, right, or Germany or Pennsylvania or New York, or Candor, New York, or Tennessee, right? Wherever you you go and you may suffer both now and forever, right? Christ is there and the greatness of Christ is with you, 
Amen. Second, it's better to trust him, obey him, and to suffer than to not know God, to disobey God, and to be cast in prison, right, that verse 19 refers to. Right? And this is what happened to the spirits in Noah's day. They thought it was foolish to heed the call of God like Noah did. And so they stayed comfortable and they stayed respectable until the rain started. Right? Until the rain started and reality hit them. And this is again why people can be converted with a message that calls for suffering. The reality is, is sometimes it's suffering that will keep them out of eternal hell. I have a dear friend that is on his deathbed in Columbus, Ohio, Shelby Cutlet, and he's right now fighting for his life and is likely on his deathbed. But his story is being made famous to the glory of God. My former pastor, because of all this that's going on and because of what happened with coronavirus, and the, and the reality is, is that pastors are very limited in being able to visit people uh, in the hospital. But my former pastor, John Bouquet, he called up uh, and was able to get a hold of the governor of Ohio, and the governor of Ohio uh, considered him essential and allowed and has allowed him to go in and to pray for this man and to anoint him. And through these things, the gospel is being shared on a public stage right now. That they got videos of my past, my former pastor praying with this man, and it's going viral, and people are freaking out, and that is. All God doing that. God still uses suffering to bring people to himself. Here's the third thing that we learn from Noah. It's no dif- disadvantage to you to be a small, rejected minority. Okay? That's the point of verse 20 where it says this about the ark. A few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Just imagine how foolish they felt to be such a small minority. But the point is this, if you're a minority with God, you will be saved and the tables will turn. I'd rather be small with God than big without him. And so when suffering comes, don't throw away your confidence that has this great reward. Noah teaches us so much, and I think that's why we need to kind of wrestle through that because there's something to be learned there. All right, but but now I'm going to jump back into the main outline. We're cooking, okay? I only got two more points, and then we're done. Here's the fourth thing. Uh, The passage jumps into this, and this is something we got to kind of unpack too, is that we need to know the meaning of baptism. We need to know the meaning of baptism. So the fourth way that Peter strengthens us for suffering is by describing the meaning of baptism. Okay, the flood wire, the floodwaters that brought judgment on the world in Noah's day reminds Peter of Christian baptism. Verse 21. And corresponding to that, he's talking about the flood, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so verse 18 says this that Christ died for sins and brought us to God. Okay, in other words, Christ saves us. But but the question now is this well, who saves us? Who saves us? Whom does Christ's death actually save? And that's what verse 21 answers. Those who are baptized, okay? And don't lose me here on this, okay? Those who are baptized. But Peter knows that this would be misunderstood if he doesn't qualify that statement. Just like how, if I was to say that today, some of us might be confused as to what it means. So he says, so this is what he says. Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience, okay? And this is virtually the definition of baptism. Baptism is this outward expression of a spiritual inward appeal to God for cleansing. In other words, okay, baptism is a way of saying to God, I trust you to apply the death of Jesus Christ to me for my sins and to bring me through death and judgment into a new and everlasting, you see what I did there with my arms, right? Being being immersed and then rising out of the water, okay? So I trust you apply the death of Jesus to me for my sins and to bring me through the death and judgment into new and everlasting life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So baptism, listen, it may cleanse the body because it's 
fully immersed, okay? But that's not why he says it saves. It saves for one reason. It's an expression of faith. Church, what I just said. Baptism is what? It's an expression of faith. It's an appeal of faith. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, 13, that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And baptism is one of those callings. It's an appeal to the Lord. Amen? So how does this, how does baptism strengthen us for suffering with Christ? And, and, and he, here's the main point, okay? When we've come through the waters of baptism, okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use this, this motion, okay? So here you are, okay, and you're being dunked, and you're being raised again out of the water, okay? So, so when we've come through the waters of baptism, we have passed through death and judgment. We have been buried with Christ, and then we've been risen with Him. We pass from death into life. Judgment is path, and suffering we are experiencing cannot be the condemnation of God. It's already passed, right? It's already been experienced for us by Christ. We've received that by faith, and we've expressed our faith by baptism. And it stands as a constant reminder. Our baptism stands as a constant reminder that the worst suffering has been averted. Christ took it for us. And we will never have to come into judgment. There is now no condemnation. We have already died that death in Christ and have been raised in Him. Therefore, our present suffering is not the wrath of God, but the loving discipline of our Father and the preparation for glory. That's why baptism is important. Here's the fifth thing, last thing. We're to look at Christ. We're to look. We're to look to Christ as God's right hand ruling over all. Okay. So one last way that Peter strengthens us for suffering, okay, is that he shows us that Christ is at the right hand of God ruling all over, over all angels and authorities and powers. Verse 22. Okay. Literally says this. He is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers, and have been subjected to Him. So I want you to take this one thought with you in, in your preparation for suffering. No amount of harassing, no amount of oppression, no amount of deceiving, no, no accusing demon is free to do as he pleases. All angels and authorities and powers and devils and evil spirits and demons and people who don't like us, right? Satan himself are subject to Jesus Christ. When Peter says at the end of this letter, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, he says that the devil prowls around like a lion seeking what? Whom he may devour. Right? And we're to resist him with your faith. This is the faith that he has in mind. The faith that all angels and authorities and powers are subject to Jesus. And this is what we rebuke and we resist the devil with. You are subject to Jesus. Jesus reigns at God's right hand and you are under him and you can do nothing without his permission. You say to the devil, you're a cat on the chain. You can't touch me unless he lets you. And he will only let you to the degree that your touch will turn for my good and for his glory. What a powerful passage of Scripture for us today. The American church, I believe, is at a very pivotal point in history. And I, 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 I'm saying this, I think that as an American church, believers have been apathetic and that we have been guilty of worshiping idols. Idols of, of church institutions and even the, the, the theatrics that go on with a high production value church experience. I believe that we're worshiping idols and that we've been focusing more on that than we have to the realization of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact that God has something more 
to do on a bigger stage than for us to pursue the American dream. And everything that we talked about this morning is an encouragement to stand firm. To stand firm in this great faith and more importantly, to arm ourselves with the purpose of Christ. The man of God came not to be saved but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and we as the church are called to follow him in this mission we're called to suffer for the purpose of the gospel and i believe that we're about to see the reality of that come more and more than ever before church i love you thank you for uh allowing me this opportunity to preach this this morning let's pray father God, we, we just come to you, Lord, today. We come in just a humble spirit, Father. I, I pray, Lord, that, God, what was spoken today is just truth from your word. And, God, I just pray for your, your spirit to do a work in us, to wake us up. Father, that we would just be moved to the point of conviction and repentance in our life, Lord, that we would realize the reality of your gospel and that sometimes people, believers, will go through unjust suffering just for the purpose of evangelistic reasons. God, help us to just not be just dull and unattentive to the fact that we are surrounded by people in our in our in our our community in our nation around the globe that don't know you and so god i i pray lord that that we would posture and position ourselves lord to to follow your lead and your example and to 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 be able to um have your kingdom and eternity in view in everything that we say and do god help wake us up help us stop to be inward focused but to just be outward focused god i i pray for i lord i pray for those uh that that are suffering and lord, lord we realize this that sometimes suffering is self-inflicted right we make bad choices and we suffer the consequences of those decisions and we suffer because of it Lord. by and i recognize lord that there's a lot of suffering that goes on that's that's not because of our bad choices but father help us to just be to be tuned into the fact that you're doing something bigger and better lord and in your grace and in your wisdom Lord, you are loving people and you are calling people to yourself and we get to be a part of that gospel testimony. So God, we just give this to you. I thank you for this time uh, that we can share this. I thank you for this time uh, that I could do this online and just getting ready for uh, Sunday morning. Father, uh, I pray that I'm just removed out of the situation that you would be glorified. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, love you. Thank you for hanging in there. And uh, we're praying for you. If you need something this week, uh, be sure to reach out and, uh, and give us a call. And um, talk to you soon. Bye.